Hi, the Black Talk Media Project would like to invite you to become a member of the BTR Community subscription-based social media platform. BTR Community is a platform that was set up for the listening audience of Black Talk Radio Network, the number one independent black radio network online. For just $24 per year, your subscription gives you access to an interactive space to share information with like-minded people with your privacy guaranteed. Your subscription will go a long way to help us maintain and improve our current media platforms. It will also help provide a budget so that we can begin the task of establishing localized media centers and radio stations across the United States. The best way to show your support and appreciation for what we do here at Black Talk Radio is to subscribe. Help us to help you be informed. Join btrcommunity.com today. Views and opinions expressed by callers, guests, and hosts do not necessarily reflect those of the Black Talk Radio Network and Black Talk Media Project. Black Talk Radio is new black media for the new millennium. Let your wise rise up, see the signs of the times, if it's time, rise up, rise up. When death and hell dwell among all God's people, when those we chose and trusted have become completely corrupted and inherently evil, when the feast that feeds you starves our father's children, when snuff porn and pedo forms begin to get top billing, rise up. When famine claims millions, when justice gives blind eyes to billions, when the Lord's anger is no longer feared, if his protection is gone and your enemies are near, if you've seen the sea spill over and the mountains shake, break, and fall, if the moon ever turns blood red and you can't see the sun at all, rise up, no matter if the prize is high in the skies or deep. In perdition, if our leaders are globally despised and always seem to rise to attrition or blatant nepotism, if women and children have to live in impossible conditions, if you hey Max, we can't hear you, bro. Someone else's damn decisions rise up. Rise Peace and welcome to this on the Black Talk Radio Network, a program that seeks to educate, inform, and agitate on the issue of 21st century legalized slavery, hosted by social activists and spoken word poet Max Parthas and Black Talk Media Project founder Scotty Reed. On this program, we discuss recent news on legalized 21st century slavery and human trafficking as it is allowed through the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution along with projects and people who help combat it. Please remember, we are now streaming live from newabolitionistmovement.com. This is our January 24th, 2018 broadcast in our sixth season. On this day in history, January 24th, 1956, Look Magazine published the confessions of J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant, two white men from Mississippi who were acquitted in the 1955 kidnapping and murder of Emmett Lewis Till an African-American teenager from Chicago. In the Look article titled The Shocking Story of Approved Killings in Mississippi, the men detailed how they beat Till with a gun, shot him and threw his body in the Tallahatchie River with a heavy cotton gin fan attached with barbed wire to his neck to weigh him down. The two killers were paid a reported $4,000 for their participation in the article. Our abolitionist in profile tonight is the Reverend Mr. Kelly. Tonight will likely be the first time his words have been read publicly in over 150 years. We'll share his anecdotal speech regarding one man's experience with the system of slavery. In this segment, For Freedom's Sake, A History of Rebellion, we remember the bittersweet victory at St. Dominique. Our rider of the 21st Century Underground Railroad is Thomas Sierra. On February 7, 1997, the jury convicted Sierra of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to 45 years in prison on the murder charge and an additional 10 years in prison for firearm charges 
for a total of 55 years. On January 9, 2018, the prosecution agreed to vacate Sierra's conviction and dismiss the case. As usual, we'll dissect and disseminate current news and events related to 13th Amendment slavery from the perspective of abolitionists. Have a question or comment? You can call us toll-free at 1-866-510-9025. You can chat with us and others by logging in at uberconference.com, Black Talk, slash Black Talk Radio Network. Once again, I'm Max Parthas. What's happening, Brother Scotty? Hey, I'm doing the best I can behind these enemy lines. Good to be back on the air with you and the listeners for New Abolitionist Radio, which I feel like is one of the most important projects I have ever been a part of. And it's just been a pleasure working with you as we are in our, well, about to go into our, have we entered into the sixth season yet? Or do we got an anniversary coming up soon? But I know, man, we've been at it for a while, man, and I do see that we have been successful in raising uh, the 13th Amendment with the public, and it's just great, man. It's just great to see that. Yes, sir, man. I feel the same way. We went on air for the first time uh, 2012, June 13th, our anniversary. So we're in our sixth season now. And uh, we have made some incredible strides in educating people on what's happening, giving them some focus to uh, really put their efforts into. And we're seeing the, the, the results of that everywhere. As a matter of fact, just today I was looking at my timeline, and it's the anniversary of the uh, film The 13th, which came out from Ava DuVernay just a year ago. Really? Wow. What, hey, the Oscar-nominated film 13th. Yes, Oscar nominated. Um, and it's an incredible film. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. It's called 13th. I must admit that it does not offer abolition as an answer, but it doesn't offer any answers. It only exposes what the 13th Amendment has uh, wrought over these last 153 years. And that's important in itself. And we did a program breaking down the film and yeah we have our criticisms of it but very appreciative that the 13th amendment was even put in front of a wider public so you know well max i'm gonna ask you this man honestly with no hubris or or anything like that do you think that film gets made if new abolitionist radio had not been on had not been broadcasting not at all um and like you said without hubris I'm not trying to toot any horns, but I watched this all unfold with you. We watched how the chain of events and the news spread from the source that is New Abolitionist Radio. And eventually it became a film called The 13th. Uh, it's how the butterfly uh, theory effects, uh, the butter butterfly effect works. You know, you just push one domino and you watch all the other dominoes start to fall. And I think that we had a direct result, uh, a direct effect on the 13th uh, movie coming out. Well, I feel like right now my personal goal, you know, in setting goals, I think is very important. Like in any war, they set goals, man. They, they, they designate battles. And right now that domino I'm trying to push over is, is I want to finish the job that Barack Obama never did. Because I feel like although private prisons aren't as plentiful or there's not as many as we have public and federal uh, jails, I still feel like if we push that domino over, man, it could start a chain reaction. And I'm still very disappointed that Barack Obama chose not to ban the use of private prisons in, in government contracts with these private prisons at the beginning of his second term and waited to the last two months. And, you know, I feel like that was strategic, man. I feel like that was strategic. But even to get him to do that, even though that very next week after the announcement, they signed the new contract, but still, though, it just validates what we've been saying. And, and not just we, but I, I'm speaking of the entire abolitionist movement and all our comrades and, and organizations out there. I, that's, that's my focus, my singular focus right now, Max. I'm trying to get 
I'm trying to end private prisons. Yeah, we've been working on that for quite some time, and we had some relative success stories to talk about. We almost killed them in a single day on, uh, I believe it was the August 18th of 2016, when their stocks crashed to the floor, and they were rescued by Wall Street, who stopped trading. Otherwise, they would have went out of business that day. So we know that we can make them bleed, and if we can make them bleed, we can kill them. So uh, definitely a good goal. I'm kind of torn because, you know, for so many years, Educating has been my primary objective, just getting people to understand the problem and what they're dealing with um, in contrast to the lies that they have been told. And that has been a huge effort that, that we've participated in now for nearly a decade, Scotty. And it, it's not over yet. There are still so many people out there that just don't understand it and they don't get it. And the cognitive dissonance kicks in uh, heavily for them when you start telling them that, Slavery never ended. They kind of look at you and laugh like, ah, you're kidding. And uh, it's just a difficult task to try to educate people. So I'm still trying to do that as my main thing because I, I believe that critical mass is the answer. Once enough people know, then we start pushing this thing further and further. But I also found that a target audience can make all the difference in the world because, for instance, what's going on with the prisoners right now? I mean, they are really rising up to fight for their rights as human beings. And they've adopted right. this uh, abolitionist movement as their primary mode of doing that, including right. what's happening right now with Operation Push in Florida. People are literally risking their lives and their freedom inside the prison. Right, right. You know, Max, going back to something you said, when you said that the cognitive dissonance and people don't believe you, but what's worse is people who do believe you, but it's not at the top of their priorities. They'll talk about everything under the sun except for slavery. And and we know they know. And that's worse than a person who don't believe you is a person who knows and does nothing with that knowledge. Yes, Scotty, I have experienced that uh, often, <laughs> often where I've given lectures and uh been to speaking engagements and giving workshops and the people that were there was like, yes, Max, I'm with you. You're hundred percent right. And then a few weeks later, or a few months later, or even a year later, you see them start to lose that understanding and go back to where they came from. And, uh, they start, you know, uh, being very condescending towards you, uh, in their rhetoric. And it reminds me of what Martin Luther King said about lukewarm acceptance is more bewildering than outright rejection. Right. I mean, either you believe it or you don't. And if you believe it, then freaking act like it. How you know, are you going to talk about, you know that slavery never ended, like we talked about with the pastors a couple weeks ago, uh, and then you're going to turn around and start talking about reform. <laughs> it just don't make sense. You know, I'm reminded of David Kuma, who was a congressional candidate for Congress, running for the Green Party out of Congress, I mean, out of South Carolina, and his experience in participating in a debate with with the Republican candidate and the Democratic candidate and how David's message of abolitionism and that slavery was never abolished was resonating and with the crowd and, and they were applauding him and and what he was saying. And but when it came time to go to the polls, you know, they went back to doing what they always did. And that's voting for the establishment, you know, candidate of whatever uh, political persuasion they were. They they it just didn't translate into, hey, he's the only one up here this, that has a real message. Slavery was never abolished. We need to abolish slavery. But then you don't vote for the abolitionist candidate. I, I can imagine that was very frustrating for David. Yeah, I heard him say that he wish he could have accomplished more, uh, something more longstanding in his run for uh, Congress there. But I had to, you know, tell him that, brother, you made the history books. Like, literally, you made the history books uh, here in South Carolina running on an abolitionist platform. Just because people aren't writing about it in the history books right now only shows their ignorance, not yours. So, you know, be appreciative of your own efforts and what you have done. So I appreciate what David Coleman has done. I appreciate what 
uh, Greg Jacoy has done, and uh, all of the people who have, within the past just three years, really came out full of force on an abolitionist platform to run for office in every arena. We've seen mayors run an abolitionist platform, uh, governors, congressmen, senators. That's something that has never happened before since uh, uh, since Reconstruction. Like, literally, when Reverend Amoja Ajabu ran for Congress, he was the first one to run since John Quincy Adams. And that happened in 2015. So we're talking about between 2015 and 2018, we've seen people step up and run as an abolitionist for every political office that there is. Yes, sir. Speaking of, Scotty, that's one of the stories I wanted to get in. I've got like three videos today that okay. I wanted to play and, and discuss. And since we've been talking about politics, I guess it would be a good time to bring in the video that comes from Black Division, where it's an interview with Genevieve L. Jones White, and she's running for district attorney in San Diego. And in part four of their interview with her, they asked her outright about the 13th Amendment and modern day slavery. And to hear a prospective district attorney reply in the way that she did really gave me hope, Scotty. And I think that it will give our listeners hope as well to uh, hear what she has to say. These are people openly talking about modern day slavery and human trafficking, while running for positions such as district attorney. Well, so, Scott, I, you, you had to give me some video? time to find it, bro. I'm waiting on the thread to load up completely. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so you say it's under what title? Black Divis? I'm in at our abolitionist group at btrcommunity.com. Yes, it's uh, Black Division. I found and it. It's I a, found it. There it go. Black, All right. Black Division. Okay, let me cue that up. And this is another example of the direct effects from New Abolitionist Radio. So, the 13th Amendment. Um, many people know, some don't, that uh, it allows for technically for slavery, right? Slavery is still legal. What role does you do you think that plays uh, with private prisons, with inmates doing work? What role do you think that plays in the incarceration rate? And um, as DA, with that being the actual law, is there anything that you can do to slow that down and, and to curb that incentive? So I don't think that the 13th Amendment technically allows for slavery. It allows for slavery. Okay. There's nothing technical about it. Right. It is right there in black and white that you can be placed into involuntary servitude as punishment for a crime. Mm -hmm. And so I'm against private prisons. I think every single one should be abolished. They need to be shut down. I believe that it is not something that should be a part of a decent society where people actually make money off the backs of inmates. And right now we have it where businesses whose bottom line is money are running our prison system. Mm -hmm. And so the things that we're seeing occur across this county, because there are lots of private prisons here in San Diego. And a lot of people say, well, we're not Texas. Well, the same folks running GEO and CCA in Texas run the same private right. prison facilities here. And so as a- And the GEO group and CCA, those are private prison. Yes. Right, okay. Yes. Right. And so we're seeing them command our immigration detention facilities in Old Thai. There's one across the street from the courthouse downtown. There's one on Boston Avenue right in Southeast San Diego. And these are not the only private facilities. And so I believe that as a decent society, an advanced society, there's no room for private prisons. Because what happens with private prisons is they are in for profit. That is why they're in business. And so they absolutely have a business in keeping their beds full. Mm -hmm. So when we start to talk about the general mentality of DAs where it is law and order, I'm going to use a hammer every time. We need to fill these beds because private prisons get paid off of who's in the beds. Mm -hmm. That's where there's a conflict of interest. 
We cannot continue to send people into prisons so that people can profit off of that. And I believe this, whether they're private prisons or state run prisons, Mm. when we're talking about unions, some of the unions for correctional officers are the biggest and most powerful unions. These are some of the biggest lobbyist groups. And we have to start to uncover why that is. I believe that we have too many prisons in California. We need to start to close them down. And we're never going to do that if people are not in the business of people. We're going to continue to do this when people are in the business for profit. There's there's people out there, because we had the abolitionist movement of the past with um, ending antebellum slavery. There's abolitionists today who would say, we need to abolish the 13th Amendment. We shouldn't have slavery in this country at all. Would you agree or disagree with that? And could you call yourself an abolitionist? So the 13th Amendment, with the exception of that exception, Mm -hmm. is fine. Okay. Right. Because with the 13th Amendment, we did abolish slavery. And that's great. Right. Antebellum, that form. Yes. Let's take out this exception for involuntary servitude. And the 13th Amendment is all good because then we're not allowing for any form of slavery, which is what the 13th Amendment should have been originally. Okay, so you agree with abolishing the exception clause of the 13th Amendment? Absolutely. We just had wildfires all in North County last week. We have volunteer firefighters that are our inmates being paid literally a dollar a day. They are risking their lives Mm. to save people. That's involuntary servitude. I understand that they're getting two dollars, but what we're paying them is actually not enough. But we get away with that because they're inmates. And so my argument has always been, can this person get a job when they get out? Mm -hmm. And this isn't even just about our volunteer firefighters from fire camp. This is about businesses who have been making money inside of our prisons, businesses that I won't name right now because I don't want to make them more famous than what they already are. But there are a lot of companies that I've been boycotting for at least 20 years because of their role in the prison industrial complex. So you have men in prisons helping you with your business. And when they get out, you say no to them for a job because they have a conviction. But it was okay for them to make money for you while they were locked up. So again, We've got to stop this insanity of this prison industrial complex. And while I'm on that point, our leaders need to stop taking money from the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. And we have leaders here in San Diego who take money from private prisons. So again, when your bottom line is money and it's not people, you're never going to make the right decisions. You can support me, Jones Wright for DA 2018 by going to my website, www.joneswright4da.com. That is F-O-R, not the number. J-O-N-E-S-W-R-I-G-H-T, F-O-R-D-A.com. There you can sign up to volunteer. There's a big red donate button. Even if you don't have a lot of money, I'm getting dollar donations. I'm happy to accept them. This is a people power campaign. So if you can't give a lot, just give what you can because you understand the change that's needed. Follow me on social media. I am on Twitter. I am on Instagram. I am on Facebook. Jones Wright, the number four DA is my Twitter handle. Also my handle for Instagram. You can find me on Facebook. Just go to Jones Wright for DA. You're going to love the videos I put up. I keep it real at all times. So follow me on social media. Man, now we got DAs running on abolitionist platform. And you know that's a direct result of the efforts of the new abolitionist movement, all the people involved. As a matter of fact, the person doing the interviewing is a listener of New Abolitionist Radio. And the information that the prospective DA, uh, Genevieve uh, Jones-Wright, is uh, providing comes from the information that this movement has been providing to the whole country. I think it's important, Max, since she is on social media, I think it's important that all the abolitionists on social media, that we not only follow her on social media, but we raise her profile and that we make her go viral to support her 
campaign. Who knows? She might be the first abolitionist to run for office in in that county. So, you know, it, it the stuff that don't deserve attention gets attention. The stuff that needs to get attention, the people that need attention, it's just sad. So we're, as abolitionists, we're going to have to step up our game and we're going to have to support people like her who know what the problem is, but more importantly, want to do something about it. Yes, I'm very proud to know that I live in a time when a district attorney is running on an abolitionist platform because that just means freedom is on the horizon. Uh, Scotty, you and I have been blessed to see these things occur one after the other, uh, you know, in every office in the land. I suspect this year we'll have a presidential candidate running on an abolitionist platform. You think so? I think so. Uh, we were real close with the uh, 2016 uh, race. Bernie Sanders came out and talked about the private prison organization. He also uh, helped to bring forth the Justice Is Not For Sale Act of 2015, which would have banned private prisons from the United States of America forever, giving them two years to pack up and get the hell out. So we can see the envelope right on the edge of the table, and it's about to go over it. Well, Max... I want to be optimistic, and but let me put it this way. There are issues with Bernie Sanders' platform, like in foreign policy, that I do not agree with. But I understand I'm not going to agree 100%, especially with, with political candidates and what have you. But if that's going to be part of his platform again, then you don't have no other option. Not as an abolitionist. But here's where I'm skeptical. We saw what the establishment did to Bernie Sanders. And I'm still hearing, like I was listening to a radio program today, we got some diehard Democrats out there who just don't get it, who just don't get it. They get all their news from CNN, MSNBC, and what have you, and all they do is repeat those talking points. And... They hate Bernie Sanders. We saw the dirty tactics and, and voter su suppression and, and just how it was just rigged. Their Democratic primary was rigged. So he has a lot of enemies. I hope that he will run as an independent and not part of the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party, they willing to shut the government down. And, and I'm an empathetic person. OK, but with these children, you know, young people that was brought here um, undocumented as children it's about 800,000 of them. But here's my thing, though. There are more people being there are millions of people, millions of families being impacted by 21st century slavery and human trafficking. And I ain't never heard of the government shutting down over that. How about, and I tweeted this at Keith Ellison, who also sponsored the Justice Is Not For Sale Act. When he was talking about DACA on Twitter, I said, with all due respect, sir, you have people who can vote, who, and I'm talking your black constituency, I'm talking black voters and what have you, and when y'all gonna shut, when y'all gonna shut the, gut, the government down over issues that's primarily affecting us, like the uh, prison slavery, like the drug war, you know? And, and so, I, you know, I try to be positive with people and respect them, but I'm losing my patience. Well, Scotty, I have to say that I don't have all that faith in uh, Senator Sanders either, and I never did, not even for Right, you never the did, you said that. I beat Senator Sanders is because he had the gall to stand up in front of a crowd and say that nobody in America practices slavery today. And I challenged that statement and then went directly to his camp to challenge that st statement and provided the information to prove that, yes, people are participating in modern-day slavery today. And uh, I also believe that the rhetoric we see coming out of politicians now talking about these issues and not because they want to talk about them, because it's been around for a long time and they never chose to talk about them before, it's because people like us in the new abolitionist movement made it a hot button. 
we demanded that this be talked about. We, we put out so much information that changed so many hearts and minds that they had no choice but to discuss this. And once you start talking about it, it's a rabbit hole that's only going to lead you in one direction. Right, right. So I'm going to have to clip that video and make a video, you know, because I've made a couple of videos uh, over the past few days telling people you want to boy you in the mood to boycott something boycott something that's impacting millions of people not just one person and and so i'm going to include her into you know these videos trying to get people to boycott the six banks that's underwriting private prisons you know scotty speaking of that i know you have this uh this effort that you're putting forth called Profit from Pain is Inhumane and you're trying to get people to boycott the banks, they have a similar movement going on inside the prisons. Uh, It's coming from the Free Alabama movement as well as other abolitionist organizations within the prisons, uh, jailhouse lawyers speak, and a friend of mine uh, who goes by the name of Swift Swift Justice uh, sent a video out from inside the prison about what it is they're trying to accomplish and it's called redistribute the paint and it's all about boycotting and it's about six minutes long it's one of the other videos i wanted to play today i put it on the planning page at the very bottom just now so you can find it easily because it has no title it's just a black uh, box but uh, i wouldn't mind playing that it came from my sister jones naisha okay. uh, the wife of swiss justice and they talk about what the prisoners are planning to do and what they want from us just give me a moment. I need to refresh the thread if you just posted it there, and, and I have it up. Let me see. Okay. Yep. Is it the it Unheard already. Voices? The bottom end so you get it easily. Unheard Voices? Yes. Okay. It's loading up now. Give me just a second. All right. This is from my brother uh, of the Alabama Free Alabama Movement, Swift Justice, and it's what they're trying to accomplish and what they want us to participate in. Name of family. This is Swift Justice with Unheard Voices OTCJ coming to you live from the Alabama Department of Corrections. And yesterday I touched on a few things dealing with the campaign that is coming uh, coming forward here next month that has been launched by the Free Alabama Movement, Brother Rasan, and what it is going to consist of is what we're going to talk about today and why they have called for this action. You should know that uh, we're going to start this campaign next month by boycotting here in Alabama. What we're going to be boycotting is pretty much simple things. First and foremost, we're going to be boycotting the wall phones that are being used to call home collectively. In other words, the phone bills that you pay a high price on, we're going to sit there and say we're not going to use it in the month of February. Not only that, we're going to come back and April, June, August, and October, and December of this year, and also boycott these things. The next thing on the agenda is going to be the canteen, the store, the snack line, as we call it here in Alabama. The next thing will be the incentive package purchases and the visitation vending, as well as any and all electronic visits across America. Like I said, we're going to, again, in April... June, August, October, and December do this once again to make our statement and make it loud let our voices be heard but this will start in February now although we have, we're going to launch this campaign based here in Alabama, it's going to be called for across the nation in our sister and brother states we all have the same obstacles, we all have the same oppressions we all are going to have to have the same goals you may be listening to this and you may ask me what are our goals and exactly what or how will this campaign help to achieve our goals? Well, first and foremost, you're going to have to understand a few things about our goals. and Then you're going to have to realize why it is so important that you, as an individual who is out there and has family members out there, listen and become a part of this boycott. Now, what do I mean by this? What do I mean by you have to understand our goals? Our goal is to, def- is to defund and bankrupt the Alabama Department of Corrections and all other Department of Corrections across America. 
Why are we out to bankrupt and defund these corporations? Well, first and foremost, you have to understand that the things that I listed above, dealing with the collect calls, the canteen, the incentive packages, and the visitations, all fund your family members' incarceration. And if you're incarcerated and you're listening to this, please understand you are funding your own incarceration by participating in these acts, in these things that is everyday, regular prison life. Now, ask yourself, what company does your loved one call from the wall phone on? Is it Globatel? Is it whatever company you might have? I don't know what companies might be across America. But whatever company it is that you, that you are paying, understand you are paying millions upon millions of dollars and, you're, and, and these companies are paying kickbacks to these states in order to incarcerate your family. Now, if you are sending money for your loved one to purchase canteen items, which I understand there's some things on these canteens that we have to have. It's a necessity. But other things are habits and wants, not necessities. And if during these months of February, April, June, August, October, and December, we're asking each and every last individual inside the prison system, as well as the family members, to make a sacrifice, to make a statement, saying that we're no longer going to ignorantly send our money in for you, the Department of Corrections, to continue to facilitate our loved ones incarceration. Millions upon millions of dollars are funneled from inside our prisons across the United States. We're not talking about the corporations that use, uh, use inmate labor. We're talking about the Alabama Department of Corrections, the Mississippi Department of Corrections, the Florida Department of Corrections, Ohio, California. Department of Corrections use, make millions upon millions of dollars off of you, a family member of those who are incarcerated, in order to continue incarcerating your loved one. And as long as they can incarcerate your loved ones, they know good and well you're going to continue sending that money to them. Take for instance here in Alabama, the Department of Corrections here in Alabama uses the canteen funds for certain things such as, but not limited to, Purchasing officer uniforms, purchasing handcuffs to handcuff inmates, purchasing mace to spray an inmate, purchasing their batons, purchasing zip ties, purchasing anything that can help oppress your loved one or help abuse your loved one. By setting down these months, we are going to cause a confusion and cause a, a such a such chaos to where Alabama Department of Corrections will have to use their own funding from the general funds given by the Senate. They're already struggling to meet the budget each and every year. They're already having to uh, do, do cutbacks each and every year with the Department of Corrections. Nothing bad is going to happen if we boycott and we are successful by boycotting these things. Only good can come out of the earth. What do I mean good can come out of this? What I mean by that is your loved one could possibly be released because they cannot afford to incarcerate him no more. Would you rather see your loved one eating a soup or eating a cheeseburger behind the walls? Or would you rather see your son coming home and eating a steak? Would you rather see your father coming home and eating with their children? Which one is more important to you? The thing about things are, we can't continue making these slogans such as Black Lives Matter, Prisoners Lives Matter, White Lives Matter, any of this. We can't continue doing that thing. We're going to have to start coming together and moving. And the only and the best way that we can do that is to turn around and make an economic impact upon the Alabama Department of Corrections and the Department of Corrections across the United States, whether it be state or federal. Brother Rasun has come up with a good plan and a good and, and a good campaign, and we support him with unheard voices. OTCJ again. I am Swift Justice, and I am turning around and I'm asking all my chapter leaders around the state that we have unheard voices at, such as in California, Marissa, in California. I've asked her to continue to push this campaign out there to all individuals who are in California and you have loved ones during the month of February. Support what we're doing and pushing this campaign boycott any spending of your hard-earned taxpaying money and make a difference. Tomorrow I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about this some more. Until then, think about what I said. Are you going to continue 
facilitating the finances to incarcerate your family members. And for those inside, are you going to continue having your family continue to facilitate your own incarceration? As Brother Rasan said in, in one of his articles, whose side are you on? Peace. All right. Uh, shout out to my brother, Swift Justice, out in the Alabama prison, prison and to the Free Alabama Movement and to the Unheard Voices uh, who are making things like this possible. So they have a Scotty, uh, they're calling for a boycott of the things that the prisoners are using and that's exploiting the family members, like these video conferences calls and the phone calls that are charging them an arm and a leg and uh, the money that you have to send in and they take percentages out of it. Right. You know, Max, I had the same thought as I was making those videos about boycotting these six banks. And, you know, the number one reason you should boycott them is because they are, without them underwriting the day-to-day -day business, you know, things with these private prison companies, they wouldn't be able to exist. They, ha they have to have these banks to underwrite it, to extend them lines of credit and stuff like that. And that's the number one reason. But then many of these are the very same banks that uh, put together these toxic derivatives that were tied into mortgages that nearly brought the global economy down. And, and then turn around and the U.S. government handed them taxpayer money that they ain't never had to pay back to bail them out. To bail them out. If they'd have went down, private prisons would have went down. Cause they're all it's the system is connected. It's it's all it's interconnected. And and then, you know, they put black people in the predatory loans. But we we for some reason call it cognitive dissonance, call it I don't know what to call it. I'm trying to stay positive here. I'm, I'm you know, or be cordial. But we're fun we're literally funding our own oppression. We're literally funding our own slavery. What is it going to take? What is it going to take to make you take close your account? These young people, these students, for years now, few years now, since we've been doing new abolitionist radio have been leading the charge in divestment campaigns and getting their universities to divest from these prison companies and what have you. But at the end of the day, the millions upon millions of you out there who you know you got a family member that's in prison, you know you got a friend that's in prison, and you know about all the wrongful convictions and you know about the the modern day black codes and making stuff a crime that should not be a crime. That is not a crime. But it is outlaw this, outlaw that, so we can then arrest you for it, duly convict you, and throw you in the prison to make money off of you. Yep. We are funding our own oppression. And we won't stop. What will it take, Max? What is it going to take? What is it going to take? Do we literally That's have to do the mod squad on somebody? I, I, you know that film, I, I forget the name. I might be saying the title wrong, where the brothers would kidnap a proxy racist and try to deprogram him. But what is it going to take? Are we going to have to slap some folks? I don't know, Max. Well, that's why I started out in the beginning talking about the educational process of what we're doing, trying to wake people up and give them this perspective so they can see clearly, because right now they're in full ignorance of the circumstances. But the hope is there because we keep seeing people waking up, and not only just average people, but people in positions where they're running for district attorney, and mayor, and governor, and senator, and congressman. We just got to get them more exposure so people can see it and hear it themselves and become more aware of it. And just a list of some of the companies that use prison slave labor is American Express, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan and Company, Allstate Insurance Company, Geico, Exxon Mobil Corporation, BP America, Johnson & Johnson, Sara Lee Corporation, Procter & Gamble, Sprint, AT&T, 
Verizon Communications, United Airlines, Wendy's, McDonald's, Buddha de Loom, Mary Kay Cosmetics, Walmart Stores, Quaker's Oats, and Microsoft. And that's just a few of them. And if you know these names, you can personally, like the district attorney said, uh, Genevieve said, you can boycott them yourself. You don't need 30, 40, 50,000 people to do it with you. Do it your damn self. Just don't buy from them anymore. Make a conscious decision for yourself. And that's what I've been doing for years. Like, I won't eat at McDonald's and Wendy's for that reason. I don't care if they gave it away for free. I wouldn't go and get it. I don't and think, you know, uh, Max, I, uh, I, I tell you, people know these things. Lots of people listen to this program, man. And and I'm not saying they are not doing these things and boycotting these things, but there's a lot of people that that we reach, man, that I just, I don't know why they won't act on the knowledge that they have, man. I just don't, I don't understand it. It gets depressing. You know, I've been fighting depression today, man. Really, really depressed today. But you know, I I I I got to be thankful that I'm not in prison slavery right now, and so I got to continue fighting for those that are, man. But we we need critical mass, and we need it like yesterday. Yes, we needed it 150 years ago, Scott, Scotty. 150 years ago, when the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment. First came out, there should have been an argument about that exception clause, and there wasn't. It should and have never been we, included, yeah. like you said. Max, we got a caller from uh, the 619 area code. You're on New Abolitionist Radio with Max and Scotty. Thank you for joining us. Give us your name and go ahead with your question or comment. Hey, Peace. This is uh, Tori Robinson calling from San Diego. Greetings, Tori. Peace. You're out there where you can vote for Genevieve. That's me. That's me. I'm at, I was the, I was the brother behind the camera. I'm the founder of that, of that page. Awesome, 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 brother. I was just saying, you're a listener of New Abolitionist Radio, and this is how the butterfly effect works. One person after another pushing it out further and further and educating the world. Thank you, man. No, thank yeah. you so much. I mean, I wanted to call and just say thank y'all. You know what I mean? Because like you said, I'm a listener of the page. I mean, anybody who watched that video who's a listener knows because the questions, like a couple of them, are you an abolitionist? Do we need to uh, uh, take the – that's directly coming from y'all. You know what I mean? So uh, I want to thank you guys, you know, because y'all been doing this for a long time and, like, me doing um, some black um, black targeted media, kind of local media, and some things that can impact everybody. I see how much work it is, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a lot of work, and you don't really get paid like that. But, you know, I just – you know, you guys are inspiration to keep that kind of stuff going. Well, what you just did there – could create a snowball effect, and that would be directly coming from you. Uh, say she wins her uh, DA uh, quest and she becomes district attorney. Now, other counties are going to be looking and go, oh, wow, we should do the same thing and start pulling people out who can run on the same platform. And before you know it, we got 50, 60 DAs like that. So, brother, yeah, that's all it takes. It just ask a few questions and point some things out, and it makes all the difference in the world. Tori, no, I um, agree with you. Tori, this is Scotty. Thank you for your work in media. Malcolm X said that media is the most powerful entity on the face of the planet. It controls the minds of the masses. It can make the innocent look guilty and the guilty look innocent, and that's power. So use that camera as a weapon, as you have been doing, and I'm very proud of the work that you're doing. I do have a question for you. Do you know when the election is? Will it be, you know, when people go to the pro polls for 2018 this year? So uh, June 5th, June 5th is when it is. I believe, the, and I'm not an authority on it, but I believe it's the, the primary um, is pretty much what counts the most. And uh, But whatever it is, they're pushing June 5th. And if you want to know more about it, just go to uh, uh, Jones Wright, right with the W R I G H T, Jones Wright for DA.com. And they, they have the information on there. And then on the last video, we uh, the last video I'm going to post, it should be up in about uh, six days, uh, part eight of the interview series we're doing with her. Uh, she's going to explain, like, how to vote and everything. But, uh, yeah. But June 5th. Let me read that. We got five months to really push this ball and get her in office. Then. Right. 
exactly. And, you know, like I said, she's going against the incumbent. Pretty much like anybody out here in San Diego, all the years past, um, the, the whole deal on the West Coast is gangs. And um, there's a video or the video we just released today where she's describing kind of how they deal with gangs. And because they have no understanding of it, and they'll just they'll just take people who aren't gang members or just whoever, and they wrap us all up in one box and just come with draconian laws and they'll uh, drop extra gang enhancements. So they, the way they handle it, they, there's no understanding at all. So to, to sit and like just listen to her talk, it just sounds like unbelievable that, and you know, she's not alone. You know, she has supporters, but it sounds unbelievable that to have a DA like that when we're coming from what we just recently had, uh, Bonnie Demonis, and um, I think her predecessor since she stepped down and left someone, and the way they handle things is so different. It's so, it's like you pretty much, you would never expect to have a DA to stand up for the people. You understand what I mean? Yes. And I'm not, you know, yes, and I'm not big on electoral politics, but as far as local elections and the things that the DA controls, even if you're like, you know, oh, I'm not an American, oh, I don't vote, blah, blah, blah you will be a fool to ignore this specific uh, right. position. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. You know, local politics do matter. In my opinion, all politics matter, but you can more control the outcome. Well, let me put it this way. At the local level, it is not as rigged and corrupted at the national level. And these local politicians, these DAs, these elected judges, these these mayors, these city councils, you know, they have a direct impact on our lives. They can create safe zones in the, in this company in this country. They can create slavery free zones like before 1865. You know what I'm saying? It it really can't happen if people don't become disillusioned with what the corruption we see in national politics and focus focus on local politics where those people are directly setting policy that impacts your life. Right. You know, I, yeah, definitely. I, love, I love what Sister Jones said in the very beginning when you addressed the question to it, and you said <clears throat> about the 13th Amendment technically allowing slavery, and she was like, no, it's not technical. It does allow for slavery. And that just no, seemed abolition to no me. Joke. No, she ain't no joke. I, she corrected me on, like, a couple things. And that's like, yeah. like, no, no, no. I can't remember what it is, but dude, I'm too sharp, man. She's sharp. And yeah, the was, thing is, too, she grew, up, she grew up right here, actually. She know, you know, she know my mom. She grew up right there in the middle of the community, you know, and she, so she she understands uh, both sides of, you know, I feel like a, a campaign director or something, but, I mean, I'm, I'm just speaking to, you know what I mean? Well, if she wins, you should feel very proud of yourself, brother. Like I said, you could right now be the catalyst for a snowball effect. You, you never know. All you got to do is try, and you have already put it out into the universe, so the rest is up to the most high now. No, definitely. And I, and I ain't done either. I, said, I ain't done supporting. She knows she can call me. She sure. on, so. <laughs> uh, and the, the thing is, too, yeah, and, and you know, like I said, because uh, more people could volunteer, uh, more people could donate. Um, and Scotty brought up a good point, because the way you, the way you deal with these kind of local things, is like you're talking about an election who, like, in a city with two million, three million people, the difference between an election may be like three thousand people. You know what I mean? So it, it this ain't um, where it's like the the presidency, where it's like millions of people. It might just be a few thousand people, a couple thousand people, or even in the hundreds. So it's like it definitely matters when you're talking about locally. I've seen. Um I read an article recently, I, I just can't recall the details, but there was one recent state election where it actually came down to less than 10 votes. So, wow. yeah, it, it's true. But uh, another thing, though, Max, now I know we don't have the resources right now, but I just want to throw it out there to the new abolitionist community is that we need to start a super PAC. I'm not the person to do it. I'm just suggesting it. We got more qualified people to run super PACs than I. I have my hands full with, you know, Black Talk Media Project, but I definitely would contribute. I definitely will help solicit funds, but we need a, a abolitionist super PAC. 
so that we could run targeted ads, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook, because you know you can target the ads for a location, for a zip code, and what have you. And we see that's how our enemies do it. The private prisons fund both sides of the aisle. So we have to use, we first we have to pool our resources and we have to use our resources in a strategic way. And so I would love, you know, for somebody to take that up and anything I could do again. I'm not volunteering to run it because I have my hands full with Black Talk Media Project and, and trying to, you know, uh, keep it afloat. But I would lend whatever I could, whatever, you know, meager resources I do have and, and, and of course, contributing financially myself. But we need an abolitionist super PAC so we can support abolitionist candidates like her. Absolutely, Scotty. And hopefully someone takes that idea and runs with it. Indeed. You know, Swift Justice was right on the money, and so were you, Scotty. We have to make this more expensive than it's worth. This whole system of slavery has got to be more than it's worth. So they can no longer afford to do the things that they're doing, as Swift Justice was saying. We have got to demonize the companies that use prison labor, labor, the ones that profit off of this industry, and we've got to make them look like the monsters that they are. So no one will want to put any of their money into these businesses. And eventually it will come to the point where uh, they will no longer be able to do this anymore. It will just simply be too expensive. Uh, that's true. Thank you for calling in with that message, Tori. We appreciate it, man. You keep up the good work and keep us updated on what's going on uh, with the campaign and with you. And how do people follow you uh, and your work? So as of as of right now, you, uh, I'm only on um, on Facebook. I have a YouTube page. We're going to start that soon. But right now, you just go to Facebook.com/slash/BlackDivision, which that's Black T I Vision. A lot of people think I'm saying division, but it's T-I vision, black to vision, one word. Um, and just, just follow that. Um, it's a black it's a black focused platform uh, where we're doing social political issues and covering community things, mostly uh, local. However, these things are impact and inspire people anywhere. You know what I mean? But I'm doing most of my targeting local because I want to galvanize the community here and, and kind of set things up because the way Sandy well let, let me not go too far but I just want to galvanize the community here you doing and, uh, it the right way to Tor Tori I, I I'm sorry it. I'm sorry to interrupt you but you're doing it the right way that's that's my vision for the Black Talk Media Project while Black Talk Radio is global and cause we last month had people tune in from 128 countries and we mostly focus on national issues although on this program we well we we talk about the international issues as they impact the african diaspora and us but my vision was that we need localized media localized media to give the local community leaders a voice and connect them with the community so yeah. that that is a very smart strategy you know it's it, it you're doing it the right way bro no, I appreciate it because yeah, I, I've seen the same thing because there's a lot of people who they go, they go, and it, you're like, I get it, you know, it's easier, you have a bigger audience, and it's a lot tougher to just go and maybe market to 160,000 people. But my thing is, if I can get an audience that's engaged, and my real goal is not really for the platform, it's for the city and what's actually happening. So I see a lot of people doing things. A lot of San Diegans are really demoralized because there's no media source connecting us and. The people, and I know this isn't just an issue for us here, but people are fragmented and don't live right next to each other. So that uh, uh, ancient African grapevine that we have is, is a bit broken up. Word of mouth isn't really the same if we don't have media where people actually are. So that, so I agree with you. I, I feel like, look, but my thing is now what I'm realizing, I'm like, look, I'm going to keep the focus local, but there's so many people who don't live here that support the idea of what it is we're doing and get right. inspiration from what it is we're doing here. Right. The target will be local, but I would love for you guys to follow, uh, support, share in, in different groups, and, you know, just kind of get some of these things going, because even if I'm talking directly to San Diegans, um, people can support the people I put on camera, people can support whatever, and just put views and just make it look large, you know what I mean? 
so you guys can support Black Division from from anywhere, and do something similar where you're at too, man. I, you know, let's get local. Let's let's not have to. Um, it's like I know you're gonna get more views and validation if you go global with your message, but there's a lot of local messages that need to be covered as well as the global ones. So just if you jump in and you go like, hey, I'm just doing a YouTube page to everyone. Just if there if it's already saturated, just say, hey, do something local. Right, right. I agree. Word. Well, Scotty, we're running up on our nine o'clock uh, hour right now, and uh, we need to take our first break. When we come back on the other side, I want to talk about one of the ways in which prisoners are being exploited and one of the companies that's doing it, which Swift Justice was talking about, and uh, why they should be boycotted. You're listening to New Abolitionist Radio here on newabolitionistmovement.com at the Black Talk Radio Network. We're going to take a quick state identification. We'll be right back after these messages. Black Talk Media Project would like to invite you to become a member of the BTR Community subscription-based social media platform. BTR Community is a platform that was set up for the listening audience of Black Talk Radio Network, the number one independent black radio network online. For just $24 per year, your subscription gives you access to an interactive space to share information with like-minded people with your privacy guaranteed. Your subscription will go a long way to help us maintain and improve our current media platforms. It will also help provide a budget so that we can begin the task of establishing localized media centers and radio stations across the United States. The best way to show your support and appreciation for what we do here at Black Talk Radio is to subscribe. Help us to help you be informed. Join btrcommunity.com today. Welcome back to New Abolitionist Radio. I want to get into one of these stories about what Swift Justice was talking about and why they should be boycotted. For those that have been following us now for years, you know that back in 2014, my son was in prison, and I used to go from South Carolina to New Jersey to visit him. And they would let me look, <clears throat> come and visit him uh, whenever I was in town simply because I was in South Carolina and his father. But then one day, I went to the jail, and they told me that I wouldn't be able to visit him any longer from now on, I would have to pay for video chats at $15 for 10 minutes of time. And uh, as you know, I've said it on air when it occurred <clears throat> that I refused. I would not do that. I would rather just have his memory in my head than to be uh, abused and used and exploited where you're going to sell my son's image back to me for $15 for 10 minutes worth of talk time. And since that, in 2014, we've seen many counties start employing this uh, method where they're no longer even allowing visitors to come and see their loved ones. Now you are forced to use these video conferencing in order to have a visit. And this article that I have here today comes from one of our allies. It, I would like to say that it is an abolitionist media uh, uh, publication called Shadow Food. Uh, they've done articles and interviews on the abolitionist movement and as well as one on myself. And here they're talking about a county in Massachusetts that has announced now that they are no longer, no longer going to be allowing person-to-person -person visits, but instead will be implementing this video chat process, which is, of course, a pay-to-see uh, system. Now, they uh, say that they're doing it because they want to uh, cut down on the amount of contraband that is coming into the prisons. But we all know that the contraband primarily comes in through the guards themselves. So cutting right. out visitations is not going to cut down contraband. It's just going to exploit the families. And I'll read a quote from the article, which is available on our page on New Abolitionist Radio on Facebook, as well as our BTR community page. They say the real reason for the change to video visitation, according to some activists, might be money. 
It used to be just telephone companies making profits, bilking family members. Explain Lois Aaron's of the Real Cost of Prisons project. Then corporations realized there was a whole other opportunity to make more money. Aaron's told Shadowproof that schemes like the one in Bristol County, Massachusetts, usually involve a financial kickback in the form of commissions to jails and prison administrators that use them. These kickbacks are generally unregulated and provided with no strings attached, making them appealing to the authorities. It's money they can spend any way they want to. And that's just one quote from the entire article, but it really breaks down what's occurring here is the way they're exploiting not just the people who are behind bars, but their entire families. Scotty? I don't have much to add except to just just ask yourself, people. We have Skype video. It's free. It's free, right? Uh, you got Facebook video. It's free, right? You got all these different apps that's free that allow you to do video conferencing. So you got to ask yourself, well, why why aren't they using those free services? I mean, you can even purchase software, install it on the computer. So what I'm saying is there is no reason in the world except for making a profit that this is costing people. You know, my I, my uncle went through the same thing with, with his son, my cousin Tony, when they had him in jail up there in Maryland on, on a trumped up charge. And thankfully, Tony was able to get out of that. But that's, you know, had to pay the same exorbitant rates and what have you. So the the motive is profit. The motive is 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 not really to keep contraband from coming into the jail or the prison plantation because as Max said, we know primarily it is the guards who bring it in. You know, those who, who curate these stories, we see the stories. And, and so, you know, this is, again, just another element of the system of slavery just trying to squeeze every penny it can out of the victims of modern day slavery and human trafficking and their families. So there's just no justification for this. And then any psychologist will tell you, especially if let's 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 say, you know, the goal was to rehabilitate somebody, which it is not. Okay, it is not to correct any kind of behavior or anything of that nature. And again, I want to acknowledge that most people in prison do not belong there. Most people in prison didn't rape, didn't murder, didn't rob. They are in there because of modern day black codes. But if the goal is rehabilitation, then family contact, human contact, is very, very important. And then also, when we're talking about those who have children, as we had the Women's March 2018 the other day, I sent out a two, few tweets in support, but I couldn't help but notice all the people tweeting about that never raised the issue that, that women are the fastest growing demographic of those who are entering into prisons, primarily at the state prison level. And these women are often mothers, okay? So there's no reason. There's no reason other than a profit motive to deprive people of human contact. I'm talking about the prisoners themselves, and I'm talking about depriving their children of having that little bit of human contact that, that they may be allowed through visitation. Max? Well, I think that Swift Justice is asking us all to make the same sacrifice that I just explained I made myself with my own son. I refuse. I would not buy his image. And they want you to do the same thing. You know, I have a family member whose uh, boyfriend went to jail for about three months, and she must have spent... $500 just on video conferencing. Stop that. Starting in February, uh, we know that you miss your, your family members and your loved ones, but do not put this money into the system. Take it away. Refuse to do so for at least 
Uh, I think they said that the uh, project is going on for at least three months. So for the next three months, sacrifice. Don't make these costly calls. Don't make these costly uh, video conferences. Don't send in money to commissary where they're going to take 20% of it, uh, of it out and keep it. Just stop that. And it's a huge sacrifice, and I understand that. But we need to make sacrifices to get these things done. I agree. Well, Scotty, uh, the next story that I want to get on to is going to change the subject a little bit and move towards the slave catcher aspect of it. Uh, you know, one of the most egregious pieces of news that has come out is about the assistant chief of, of police that had a lot to say about what to do when a rookie runs across a black youth, uh, including saying that if they're black teen, shoot them. And he said if it's the black mother is hot, then screw her. And he didn't say the word screw. Then he said if the father is hot, the black father, then uh, make him get down on his knees and perform fellatio. Again, he said it much cruder than that to this uh, policeman. And if he has something more to say, or if he's black, shoot him too. This came from the mouth of an assistant police chief. And he put it in writing, sending it to this uh, recruit who Through was uh, under his command. <laughs> Through and Facebook. I'd like to play the video. So, yes, Scotty? Say it through Facebook. Yes, through Facebook. He put it in writing. And we, you know, I just want to say that this is not an isolated incident. We have a lot of police chiefs, assistant police chiefs, sheriffs, and people in positions of powers who are completely racist like this and genocidal maniacs who have likely maimed, murdered, killed, and incarcerated countless innocent people. I want you to hear the news report for our listeners uh, about this incident from uh, Assistant Police Chief Todd Shaw. So, Scotty, if you could pull that up, I believe it's right up at the top of our list of this week. Uh, you're going to get mad about this, and you should be mad. And once you get mad, focus shoot that black in. people. Ex former assistant police chief tells an LMPD recruit to, quote, shoot black people. WDRB's Katrina Helmer tonight explains how the disturbing Facebook messages came to light and why the officer wasn't fired right away. Katrina. These messages are graphic, racist, and sexual. But Prospects Mayor says he had to follow the Policeman Bill of Rights before taking any action. Dark secret words uncovered. It's probably the most disgusting thing I've seen come out of the mouth of a police officer. While looking into another criminal investigation, Jefferson County Attorney Mike O'Connell discovered these private Facebook messages between now former Assistant Police Chief of Prospect Todd Shaw and an LMPD recruit. A meme shows Elmer Fudd with a gun and an offensive sign. Another shows a boy with a disability wearing a shirt with a racial slur. Anyone who shares such blatant uh, racist views should not be given a badge or a gun. In another message, the recruit asks what to do if he catches juvenile smoking marijuana. Shaw responds, F the right thing. If black, shoot them. Then Shaw suggests having sex with the juvenile's parents. Unless daddy is black, then shoot him. How could, how could anybody say these things? The Prospect Police Department hired Shaw, a former LMPD officer, in 2012. He had a clean record. Then, August 31st of last year, the Jefferson County attorney sent Prospect Mayor John Evans this letter, including parts of the Facebook messages. And I was shocked. Evans immediately told the Prospect police chief, who put Shaw on paid suspension for nearly three months while he investigated the Facebook messages. Oh, he had to take time because there was a lot of material to go through. Then, November 20th, the police chief had an interview with Shaw, and that's when Shaw resigned. Why wasn't he fired as soon as you guys found out? Because the law doesn't work that way. Mayor Evans says he knew Shaw. My only impression of Todd was that he was a bit of a character. But the mayor says there was nothing to give him any inclination Shaw would say things like this, and he got choked up talking about it. This is, I know, upsetting for you. Very, very. I'm so proud of this town. Does it hurt? Well, yes. 24 cases involving Shaw as an officer are expected to be dismissed because of these messages. The effect it has on the criminal justice system, if this goes unnoticed and unchecked, is 
extraordinarily serious and could affect rights of a lot of people. But We got blindsided. That's what it is. We just got blindsided. The LMPD recruit involved in these messages is no longer with the department. Shaw fought to keep these messages private, but a judge decided to release them. Reporting live in Prospect, I'm Katrina Helmer, WDRB News. Man. I don't even know what to say, Scotty. It's just it's infuriating. Well, allow me to. The- <laughs> we talked about this before the aspect of the so-called police bill of rights and see we were talking about voting and how important voting is and and how do you think stuff how do you think stuff gets passed into law so these police unions these thugs they lobby these politicians to pass these so-called police bill of rights now why do police need a bill of rights you got to ask you, what what do you need outside of the Bill of Rights that's part of the Constitution? So right off the gate, that's a red flag that you pat, you giving special privileges and immunity to police, okay, to slave catchers. So this is not just in um, Kentucky. It's all. I think they also, if I, if my memory serves me correct, they have a police bill of rights in in uh, Missouri. I think they have police bill of rights in Maryland. I may be incorrect, but Kentucky is not the only state with a so-called police bill of rights that was passed legislatively, legislatively. And you know, I understand people why people are turned off to politics. And they think that they vote don't matter. But I would say to you, if your vote didn't matter, they would that wouldn't be one of the things in some states they take away for life when you convicted and put into slavery and then you come out. You don't many people don't get them rights back. Or they have to jump through all kind of hoops to get them restored. If voting don't matter, then why would they do that? Why do they want to suppress it? Here in North Carolina, the Supreme Court been ruling how ruled and told North Carolina they got to redo the legislative district maps because they were racially gerrymandered. Why do they put all that time and effort if voting don't matter, people? So this guy was protected. They couldn't fire him right away because of a so-called police bill of rights. Let's say that needs to be repealed right now. Those laws need to be repealed right now. All right, and we'll use him as the poster child. Okay, now here's the other the other thing. Why isn't he facing charges? Because he's acting under the color of law. He was conspiring to violate people's rights under the color of law. That that is a criminal offense, and he can be charged. So we, yeah, Mister DA, you right to dismiss all the charges against those cases that he was involved but you also have an obligation to prosecute criminals and he's a criminal max i believe they only mentioned 12 cases are being uh dismissed this man has been in law enforcement for 26 freaking years yeah la la these years huh he was in la los angeles and we know what christopher dorner told up may he rest in power told us about the LAPD not that we needed him but he told us what he witnessed on the inside and how he was being trained to violate people yeah so 26 years a lot more than 12 people were affected and I've always said it since the beginning of this program that anytime police have been found to be corrupt their entire history of arrests need to be reviewed. And I don't care how long it takes or how much manpower is uh, involved, the people who were wrongfully incarcerated or potentially murdered or raped or however these guys conduct themselves, uh, they deserve justice and freedom. So this is something that should be automatic when the policeman is convicted or charged with anything like this. And this is by far not an isolated incident. They talked about how they were blindsided. I call BS on that because just back in 2012, the Kentucky sheriff there was brought down by two 
20-something reporters that found out that he was using the entire department uh, as a money laundering scheme and a, uh, a strong arm effort, and he was robbing the police station, he was robbing the people who he was arresting, and he was hooked on drugs. This was just a couple of years ago in Kentucky, so don't give me that, you just got blindsided BS. This is happening everywhere. Even in Louisiana, they have a sheriff who says that his view on black people is they need to be treated like animals. How the hell can we have police chiefs and sheriffs or any kind of person wearing a badge with this type of mentality? I mean, you're telling me that this is okay for them to continue in office when they think that black people need to be treated like animals. When they think that if you went across a black teenager, any smoking weed, kill him. And if his mother is hot, rape her. And if his father is hot, kill him too. Mm-mm-mm. Got it. Yeah, this, this is the part that upsets me the most when we start talking about these slave catchers. And you got the nerve to talk about good cops there is no such thing on earth as a good cop. Well, there's no well, good slave catchers. There's no good slave owners. There's no good slave traders. And there's definitely no damn good cops. Right. You asked how long. Now, the guy made the, made the comment, well, Todd was known for being a character. Well, what do you mean? You know, what was Todd doing that you consider him a quote-unquote character? Was he telling nigger jokes or something? What 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 was Todd doing, and how did Todd get promoted? This we're talking assistant police chief. He ju- he just a heartbeat away, you know, from being a police chief. So how does it happen? Well, it's a system of slavery and human trafficking. That's how it happens. When you have an immoral system, then it takes immoral people to keep that system going. So I'm in agreement with you, Max. You know, I lost, I, I think I damaged my relationship with the organization Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, who are a bunch of former cops, judges, DA, prison guards, who are speaking out against the drug war and, and, and what have you. But they stopped coming on when I started using the phrase slave catcher. Okay? And, and when I start telling the truth about, hell, there are no good cops. There are good individuals who may become right. cops, but then what happens to them? Like the one in Baltimore who spoke up after he saw a handcuffed person being kicked in the face. And when he reported them, what did they do? The, these thugs labeled him a rat and ran him off the job. The whistleblower who recorded the police captain out there telling them to go uh, uh, target black males from the age of 16 to 21, giving them a quota. And he recorded that. And then he also filed a whistleblower's lawsuit against, they tried to get him killed. That's how, the, he, like you said, Max, and the FBI in 2006 during the Bush administration produced a report that said white supremacists, ghost skins, See, Todd ain't got no Nazi tattoos, probably. Todd ain't got no visible KKK tattoos. That's why they call them ghost skins. They don't they don't tat up to to give their gang affiliation or their terrorist affiliation. And and so they call them ghost skins. Well the FBI said ghost skins were in all levels of law enforcement. And I would say even in the FBI, and they were probably the ones to put together the BIE report. Okay? So yeah, Max, I don't mean I don't mean to ramble. We got a call out of uh the NYC area, area code six four six. You're on New Abolitionist Radio. Give us your name and go ahead with your question or comment. Six four six, your last four is O six three six. Did you have a question or comment? Yes, yes, peace is tag pardon. I've been having some uh difficulties with this phone. Peace to y'all. Peace tag. He yes, said it, it uh it's great to hear y'all. I, I wasn't able to get the full uh broadcast but stepped in maybe in the definitely within the first hour and just just connecting off of what y'all are saying about this most recent uh slave catcher to 
uh, expose himself for exactly, you know, how he is and how he thinks. You know, uh, for me, I very much appreciate these stories. Uh, it's a great look, in my view, when slave catchers, you know, expose themselves and show their true colors. And I think that it's the type of thing that, you know, the, the better that we just amplify that fact, the less ammunition that these, you know, so-called, uh, you know, one bad apple or the, you know, good cops or these, you know, blue lives, uh, you know, ideologues, it, it, it takes away some of their ammunition when we just start to, you know, shout out the names from the rooftops of these, you know, slave catchers in high positions of authority oftentimes, you know, who just express themselves free, freely, you know, as, as just the, the foulest, um, the foulest among us, the foulest out here. I mean, how, how else could they be if they have this unbroken lineage to, you know, the foulest group of people in pre-1865, uh, you know, slavery. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very much uh, welcoming these kinds of stories, much like the um, election of, of, of Trump, you know, a lot of, a lot of characters get, end up getting exposed behind this kind of thing when, you know, this kind of development where you have, uh, you know, a, a more honest depiction of, of what these uh, characters are really about. Because Brother Scotty, you mentioned the ghost skins. I mean, the most capable of these slave catchers and, and the, the other various, you know, um, elements of, of the state that are out here to, you know, really do the most harm the most capable of them are way more under the radar and wouldn't even imagine uh, ranting in that way on on farce book or anywhere that, that could, you know, come back to them like that. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, sir. Well, we're going to keep harping on it, man. We are definitely going to keep harping on them. We're going to expose them every chance we get. And uh, we'll, I am personally going to continue to stand on the platform that there is no such thing as a good cop. Just that it doesn't work that way. Uh, a slave catcher is not good. I don't care how many acts of goodness you perform, when you put that badge on, you don't get the opportunity to protest the law. You just have to go out and enforce it. And you enforcing that law makes you a slave catcher. Exactly, exactly. And, and Tag is exactly right when he says the more codified white supremacist terrorists who are in law enforcement, they wouldn't they wouldn't think of, you know, uh being on Fed book and sending this message to a recruit. And I'm still unclear on how they even uncovered it. I heard that they were doing some other investigation and uncovered this, but the recruit didn't turn them in. It's not the recruit. And I was like, before you call yourself a good cop then I need to see, before you make the claim that there are good cops, I need then y'all need to be turning in these so-called bad apples before they spoil the whole bunch. But y'all already rotten to the core anyway. So, I mean, just like Slager that murdered Walter Scott, shot him in the back in South Carolina. Yeah, Slager's in jail, Slager's in prison, but what about his, his Blue Lives buddy the black cop who sat there and watched him and helped him cover it up by filing a false police report backing up Slager's false story. Nothing happened to him. He probably still on the force. So, you know. Well, Scotty, uh, I want to keep it moving tonight. I've got one more set of stories, and I'm not going to cover them all, but they together tell a tale of their own. And it's a loss that we've taken in the abolitionist movement right now. <clears throat> well, Max, and, we uh, do, first, we're right up against the break, so I want to give Tag any final comments you want to make before we go to break. Yes, sir. Tag, did you have anything to add before we go to break? Yes, just very briefly, I would I would like to raise um, the name since we're talking about uh, slave catcher whistleblowers. Um, his name was uh, Adrian, is it uh, Adrian uh, Schoolcraft? Uh, Y'all may recall the name of Adrian Schoolcraft. This was a few years ago, and um, he had 
uh, tape recorded discussions from higher ups. He was working in Brooklyn at the time where they were just flat out, they were just flat out, uh, you know, ordering uh, slave catchers to uh, continue with the unconstitutional stop and frisk practice and ordering um, these these slave catchers to just straight target, uh, uh, you know, non-white youth uh, in Brooklyn. And so he, he had developed, um, you know, a record behind that. He had all of these, you know, um, hidden uh, tapes that he had put together. And essentially, once they, uh, I guess, picked up on what was going on, however they did, they just started terrorizing him. Um, this this story broke, I don't know, a few years back now. And um, I haven't really heard any follow-up about it recently, but I know that he was facing a lot of um, intimidation That's tactics. the one I was talking about, Tag. I didn't know, okay. I couldn't recall his name. And they tried to get no him doubt. killed. Like sending him yeah. to, to high crime areas with no backup and just trying to get the man killed. So thank you for bringing his name up. Go ahead, Tag. No doubt. No, absolutely. Yeah. Adrian Schoolcraft. And, you know, it, it's it's just um, it's difficult to, to think about what kind of repression he must be facing, especially coming from a slave catcher. Like, I think his pops was a slave catcher as well, you know, so just how, you know, how um, just uh, vi- how how very incestuous, you know, that whole environment, that whole culture is, you know, where they're constantly, you know, bringing in family members and they, you know, they just kind of seem to try to promote this very like sick familial culture. And so if you, so to speak, turn on them as they see it, you know, the, uh, the evidence points toward, you know, the, the very vile and, and vicious repression that, you know, that they, um, that they point, uh, they, they direct toward these slave catchers that decide to, finally do um what's right and and whistleblow behind that so um I, besides that i would just you know say just much appreciated as ever um off the broadcast and you know we just got to continue to uh expose these these slave catchers and their 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 ways you know so just greatly appreciate you know that that y'all are continuing to do that thank you tag you want to go to break time now yes sir all right, you're listening to New Abolitionist Radio right here on the Black Talk Radio Network. We can sound now live streaming from newabolitionistmovement.com. We'll be right back after these messages. Black Talk Media Project launched the digital radio platform, Black Talk Radio Network, the first such platform created to serve the black community specifically. Black Talk Radio Network has grown with a variety of radio hosts, digital radio stations, and podcasters. Web analytics say Black Talk Radio, the platform, has an online reach that ranks it among the top independent black media platforms in the world. All of this is possible because of financial contributions to the nonprofit Black Talk Media Project. If you love the the work we do and the voices and perspectives we bring to you every day. Make a donation today to ensure that Black Talk Radio is here in the future. Black Talk Radio is new black media for the new millennium. Welcome back to New Abolitionist Radio. Scotty, we've only got 30 minutes left or less than 30 minutes in our regular segment, so I'm going to try to speed through this. It's a trilogy of stories that are not directly connected, but are indirectly connected, and they show a bigger picture. Uh, One starts with a loss that we have taken in the abolitionist movement, where the courts are now trying to change the narrative of what's going on and uh, applying cognitive dissonance themselves by refusing to accept that these prisons and these jails are using these prisoners for labor that goes beyond mopping floors. This comes out of articles penned live and is by Matt Miller, who reports on a convicted drug trafficker's civil rights aren't being violated just because he was ordered to mop the floors in a federal prison, a U.S. appeals court has ruled. 
This just came out two days ago, so this is brand new. This is so. Even though Michael Rinaldi doesn't like the pay, a panel of U.S. Court of Appeals for Third Circuit concluded, Rinaldi, who is serving more than 20 years behind bars for his participation in a cocaine distribution ring, appealed to the Third Circuit at the U.S. Middle District Senior Judge Sylvia H. Rambo tossed his lawsuit against the officials of the federal penitentiary at Canaan. He acted. As his own lawyer, Rinaldi claims the breach of his rights occurred when prison officials ordered him to sweep and mop the floors, paint walls, and empty trash cans. In reply, Rinaldi told these officers that he did not wish to work while in custody because he was not satisfied with the wages. His neatly tight suit states he claims he was told he'd be spending some time in the hole if he didn't grab a mop as soon as possible. The get-to-work orders violates his right to protection from cruel and unusual punishment and also breached the Constitution's ban on slavery. Rinaldi contended. He claimed his prison sentence doesn't include a mandate that he perform manual labor. In a ruling that covers just three pages, the circuit judges agreed with Rambo that Rinaldi's suit is frivolous. Making Rinaldi work would only constitute cruel and unusual punishment if he was physically incapable of performing the task he was assigned or if they were unduly dangerous, the circuit judges found. As for the slavery claim, it is well settled that being required to work while incarcerated does not amount to involuntary servitude, they concluded. Max, I, I don't see that as a loss for the abolitionist movement. And there was some there was the fatal flaw in his lawsuit because he incorrectly stated that slavery was abolished. It was not. Ain't no federal law against uh, 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 slavery if you've been duly convicted. OK, the Constitution, the 13th Amendment says slavery and involuntary servitude shall be abolished except as punishment for a crime. Now, the only loss that I see, and I wouldn't necessarily categorize it as a loss, but was that they didn't cite the 13th Amendment uh, slavery, you know, we can put you to work as a slave if you've been convicted. So that's the, that's the loss I see, you know, in that these judges didn't acknowledge the slavery and involuntary servitude exception clause. So I don't know who schooled him on that lawsuit, and I don't know what he was reading, but apparently he did not read the 13th Amendment. And maybe he was just recalling that inf that disinformation he got from Steven Spielberg's movie Lincoln. Max. Well, I didn't get to read everything that he uh, uh, put in his lawsuit, so it may be in there. The 13th Amendment may be quoted in there, and it may not be. I'm, I'm but not he says sure. that the that federal law outlaws slavery. Tell me where, where. How? The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And you not only that, it's probably backed up by his state constitution with the same exception clause. So his lawsuit was flawed from the beginning. Okay, and this is why it is important. This is this is why attorney I keep bothers me. Say what? The rhetoric of the court that bothers me because this is now on the record as a ruling. Okay, Particularly when they said Max, yes. it is not a loss. Okay, that's an appeals court. They didn't go to the Supreme Court or what whatever. This dude don't need to be representing himself. He needs an attorney that's going to present the right argument. So if it's a loss, it's that we got somebody that don't know what they're doing filing a lawsuit who falsely believes that slavery and involuntary servitude was abolished. So that it was yeah. it was doomed from the get go. So and that gave the opportunity to make this ruling that they would have liked to make anyway, saying it is well settled that being required to work while incarcerated does not amount to involuntary servitude. So that's a ruling right there now. Well, the ruling ain't law. It's an interpretation of the law. 
And so that does not preclude anybody in the abolitionist movement. Like if we had an attorney Ikea or, or, or Brick Grimes that's representing Mumia. This is why we need, this is why they told us, Attorney Akia, I, am I saying her name correctly? Akia. Yeah, this is why she told us it's important to have the exception clause removed for the 13th Amendment. But let's move on, Max. We got limited time, you know. Yes, uh, the other story comes out of the LA Times and it says, think prison labor is a form of slavery, think again. And since we're limited on time, I'm not going to read the article. I suggest you either get it at BTR or on New Abolitionist Radio on Facebook. But basically, it gives the people who actually use this prison slave labor the opportunity to uh, say that they are not responsible. Basically, what they're saying is that the companies are paying good money for these laborers in prison. And it's not their fault that the prisons are only paying firefighters a dollar an hour or people working in AT&T call centers inside prisons 11 cents an hour. That's not their fault. They're just hiring labor through the prison. It's the prisons that are the problem. You might want to check out that story. It's it's a way to give an excuse to these companies that we named earlier who are using prison slave labor saying it's not their fault. And the third article, which is also available on both sites, comes out of the Herald Online, a South Carolina newspaper, and it says that FC prisoners could be sentenced to work instead of prison time under proposed law. So there's a legislator who has already introduced a bill that will uh, put people to work instead of giving them additional time. And the example that they used, it says uh, that an offender would be sentenced to three to five years instead of spending 15 years in prison in the state work program. It makes work would involve 40 hour a week, a week jobs that revolve around picking up litter and repairing potholes. Well, see, again, this is setting precedences, just like the last article that I was talking about. They're saying it's only going, only going to be around repairing potholes and picking up litter. But you know, it's not limited to that. Here in South Carolina, they had prisoners working for 28 cents an hour, making Victoria's Secrets underwear. So we already know that the work camps exist here in South Carolina, and they do a lot more than just pick up litter and repair potholes. So here we are with a legislator setting precedence. It sounds great. Instead of 15 years, you get three to five. But you got to work for free, 40 hours a week, for the next five years. Again, voting is important. Again, those stories can be found on New Abolitionist Radio, on Facebook. You should check them out, and also on our BTR community. I want to say again, Max. Final segments of the evening. uh, You want to pick one to start with, and then I'll follow up on you? I just want to say, though, um, again, voting is important. We have our uh, Rider of the 21st Century Underground Railroad. We have our Rebellion, which we don't have to do this week. We're just going to play a two-minute video for our Rebellion. And the other one is our um, our abolitionist in profile. Yeah, I'm Which sorry. I had myself people. muted, Max. But before we move on to those segments, again, voting is important. This is why it's important to elect abolitionist candidates for DEA, for Congress, for Senate, okay? So that that's how, that's how you stop that kind of stuff right there. That's how you repeal the laws or precedents or whatever. Okay, so that's all. But um, let me find the stories that you set up for us, Max. Well, if you want, uh, we can just go ahead and play our rebellion, our history of rebellion video, which is two minutes long, and then you can pick out either the writer, if you want to do the writer, or the abolitionist. Man, I'm pissed day. off right now. Because <laughs> I'm looking at the L.A. Times article, Think Prison Labor is a Form of Slavery? Think again from the L.A. Times. This is propaganda, okay? This is propaganda. And and it's also a good sign because they know the abolitionist movement is growing or they would not even be asking the question. There's a fight going on, and they know it, Scotty which is why they're trying to set precedence with these legal rules. 
I am scrolling down. I'm trying to find. You'll see a picture of, uh, from the uh, rebellion of St. Dominique, which is the Haitian Revolution. Uh, there's a video link at the bottom of that uh, article. Well, Max, I, I, I'm going to let you do. Wait a minute. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to let you do all three, man, because we we running out of time, and I'm having trouble finding. Okay, I found the last slave ship. Is that the one you're talking about? No, sir. That's not the one. We probably won't even get to that article today. I'll just do new abolitionist radio. What I'll do is while you look for the rebellion uh, and the video that goes with it, I'll do the abolitionist in profile. How's okay. That? All right, as I said last week, I'm trying to give some more light and exposure to people who were abolitionists during the 1800s and before that we have never heard of but have participated in this movement, just like those today who are participating in this movement. And this is probably the first time that this man's words have been heard in over 150 years. His name is the Reverend Mr. Kelly, and this is a anecdotal speech that he made regarding one man's experience within the system of slavery. The Reverend Mr. Kelly then presented himself and was greeted with loud applause. He proceeded to lay before the meeting a most interesting and in some respects painful statement of his experience of the operation of the slave system in America and its degrading and brutalizing effect upon its unfortunate victims. He called attention to the fact that it was a rule among slaveholders to rear up their slaves in utter and absolute ignorance, well knowing that while they remained in this barbarous state, they could be more easily retained in bondage. As a proof of the baneful influence of this system, wherever it existed, existed he mentioned that although Kentucky was considered one of the mildest of the slave states, yet he believed it was fully 200 years behind the most inferior of the free states in civilization. Having given a horrifying description of the various modes of punishing slaves in the western states, he proceeded to show by reference to facts that the worst characters sketched in Uncle Tom's cabin were far from being unfair specimens of the classes which they were intended to represent. Toward the close of his discourse, the reverend gentleman asserted that the abolition of slavery was fast approaching, and one of the best proofs he could give of this fact was that the slaves themselves were beginning to be sensible of their degradation and to be filled with a strong and increasing desire for freedom. It was most encouraging to him to be enabled to come to the conclusion the world had now pronounced its verdict against slavery and for the freedom of all mankind, and that everywhere slave dealers and slave holders were beginning to be, if not already, regarded as unworthy to associate with humane and Christian men. Having stated that this was his intention to return as soon as possible to his native country, and that for the purpose of enabling him to do so, he was raising by contributions a sum of money to purchase his own freedom and to bear his expenses home. He concluded amid loud applause. His name was Edmund Kelly, and it would get, the speech was given on April 13, 1853, Freeman's Journal in Dublin. That is courtesy of the Black Abolitionist Archives, document number 14086. And we here at New Abolitionist Radio remember and salute you, Edmund Kelly. Salute, salute, definitely. Max, I, I just don't see it in the thread in the abolitionist, so I'm on Facebook on the New Abolitionist Radio page. Is it posted there? Yes, sir. Uh, I did put it there. Okay, just it's wait. At the very top. And at the uh, bottom of the uh, article is the link to the video. Okay, and I'm looking for what again, sir? It is the, uh, it's, you'll see it says New Abolitionist Radio tonight in segment for Freedom's Sake, A History of Rebellion. We remember the bittersweet victory of St. Dominique. It's an orange image. Found it. Okay. And at the bottom is the link to the video, which is two minutes long. 
the entire article tells you the story of St. Dominique and the rebellion that happened there, if you want to take the time to read it, but we're going to provide you with just a two-minute short video. All right, got it. Haiti is always described as the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. But during its height at Saint-Domingue, it was the richest place in the Americas. The thing about it, though, is that its richness was all rooted in slaves. Its wealth was based on human capital, on owning that human capital. The dominion of the master had to be absolute, but that absoluteness itself made the master into something other than human as well. Liberty, equality, fraternity, that was new for the world. The Haitian Revolution is probably the most profound revolution ever realized by human beings. The only place where slaves created a nation. But nobody wants to talk about it. In the summer of 1789, it was France that grabbed the world's attention. Parisian mobs rioted against the French king and against their own desperate poverty. Chanting slogans for liberty, equality, and brotherhood, they sparked a revolution that would fill history books for centuries to come. In the streets of Paris, the French Revolution meant an end to the appalling privileges of wealth. And France's brand new Congress, called the National Assembly, it meant the ideas of Europe's most radical thinkers could be realized. Nobody knows exactly what's going to come out of it, but just the idea of, of, of having rights, right? The idea that all people have rights, that those rights are inherent. This was something that obviously philosophers had written about before, but during the course of the French Revolution, it was written down in a text called the Declaration of the Rights of Man. It's a dangerous idea because the society is based on inequality. That's what makes it work, because it was not supposed to work for everybody. It was supposed to work for a minority. Salute to the bittersweet victory of the St. Dominique Rebellion. Salute. We remember. All right, Scotty. Man, uh, as I said, that entire article is available for you to read on New Abolitionist Radio as well as our BTR community. Uh, if you're a researcher, if you just want to learn, it's a great place to start by reading there. Our final segment for the evening will be our rider of the 21st century underground railroad i'm going to keep this one short as well it's a long story on thomas sierra which is available on new abolitionist radio i'll just read the basics and it says on february 7th 1997 the jury convicted sierra of first degree murder he was sentenced to 45 years in prison on the murder charge and an additional 10 years in prison for firearm charges for a total of 55 years on january 9th 2018, the prosecution agreed to vacate Sierra's convictions and dismiss the case. And we here at New Abolitionist Radio say welcome to freedom, Thomas Sierra. Welcome to freedom. Man, just the look on his face and the image that we made available it says it all. He's like, he couldn't be happier just to get out of there. And you know, he's only been out, I think, for a month or so, and that was on probation. So he served half of his term as an innocent man, mm -hmm. got out on probation, and then a couple months after he was out on probation, they dismissed all charges against him. The prisons are filled with people like that. And I would just point to one Todd Shaw slave catcher who told a police record, recruit to murder black people, young people caught with pot. Just thinking just how many people he could be responsible for that's in prison. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Scotty. Well, here we are at the end of our program. I guess this is time for our final comments. Um, I, I would like to say in advance thank you to our callers who uh, contributed this evening and for the work that you guys are doing out there. You are just as important as anybody else. Let's keep getting these jobs done. Scotty? Yes, as well, I'd like to thank our, thank our callers. I'd like to thank 
all those who tune in and listen. I want to thank everyone who shares all the information that we put out, whether it's through uh, btrcommunity.com or whether it's through our Facebook page, New Abolitionist Radio, or through our Facebook group, Move to Abolish 21st Century Slavery. Listen, nobody would even be asking questions about if slavery was still around or if this or that was, was slavery there wouldn't have never been a, a documentary that was nominated for an Oscar called The 13th, if not for you, if not for us. We pushing this conversation. We are the ones that are the reason that this is even an issue. So just keep up the fight. And one day I just pray that day will be soon. But we will know a day where slavery has finally been abolished. Amen, man. Um, I guess my final comments for the evening will be directed at Amazon. For those that don't know, Amazon has T-shirts available that say slavery makes shit happen. That's what it says. Slavery makes shit happen. And it has an image of two toddlers, two white toddlers, wearing these shirts that say slavery makes shit happen. This is unacceptable. In every sense of the word, not only is it unacceptable for you to use children to advance your slave catcher's cause, but it's also unacceptable that a corporate entity would have this on their uh, websites available for sale using children to advance these horrific narratives. And if you're going to boycott somebody, start with Amazon. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody who has tuned in tonight and contributed to the conversation this change is going to happen because of you, not in spite of. And that makes me proud. And I also want you to remember this. Abolition, slavery abolition, is a reason for a revolution so we can finally know peace. Peace, God. Rise up, 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 just lift your eyes up, let your eyes rise up, see the signs of the times, if it's time, rise up, rise up. When death and hell dwell among all God's people, when those we chose and trusted have become completely corrupted and inherently evil, when the feast that feeds you starves our father's children, when snuff porn and pedo forms begin to get top billing, rise up. When famine claims millions, when justice gives blind eyes to billions, when the Lord anger is no longer feared if his protection is gone and your enemies are near if you've seen the seas spill over and the mountains shake break and fall if the moon ever turns blood red and you can't see the sun at all rise up